Netflix is our big story today. Let's kick things off right there. We have all the angles covered with Julia Borston having the latest from the company. Mark Douglas is the CEO of ad tech company Mountain. He's got our advertising angle covered. Tech investor Molly Wood has our competition in streaming. And Laura Martin, Needham senior internet analyst, has our trades today. She's upgrading Netflix to hold from underperform after being vindicated with her call for the last few years that they should and would at an ad based. Here. Welcome to everybody. We're thrilled that you're here. Julia, let's start with you and get the latest. Well, the big headline here is that the company lost 200,000 subscribers in the first quarter instead of adding the 2.7 million that analysts had projected. And things are going to get worse before they get better. Netflix guided to the loss of 2 million subs in the second quarter instead of guiding to the addition of 2.6 million, which is what analysts were looking for. Now, as for its slower revenue growth, Netflix blamed market penetration, competition, sluggish economic growth, inflation, and password share to 100 million households. Now, to help reverse that slowing growth, they are working to turn some of those households into subscribers. And in a big 180, co CEO Reed Hastings saying he's open to advertising, saying ads are a key way to give consumers a lower cost choice. Allowing consumers who would like to have a lower price and are advertising tolerant um, get what they want makes a lot of sense. So that's something we're looking at now. We're trying to figure out over the next year or two. Um, but think of us as quite open to offering uh, even lower prices with advertising as a, a consumer choice. Meanwhile, co-CEO Ted Sarando says they are focused on improving the quality of the programming as well as the programming recommendations. Kelly? That was one key plank, this openness to advertising. The other, Julia, did they specifically talk about any openness to sports and live news programming? A very good question, because those were two things, advertising and live news and sports, two things that Netflix has been very clear it was opposed to for a very long time. So in the earnings call last night, there was this question, now that you're open to ads, does this mean you might also be open to sports? And the answer was not for now, that they do see a clear path to using ads to bring down the cost, to have a, a, a profitable engagement with advertising. They said it is not clear uh, that sports would do the same thing for them. Sports rights are expensive, very competitive space, and wouldn't necessarily add that much value for them. So it was still a not for now on sports and news. And remember, there just aren't that many sports rights up for grabs, and a lot of the other big tech giants, such as Apple and Amazon, are increasingly looking at those rights as well. Absolutely. Julia, thank you very, very much, our Julia Borston. Laura, I will turn to you first. If you want to tackle that aspect of this first, is it a mistake for Netflix not to be openly pursuing sports and live news right now? Yeah, I think the key point is they need to innovate faster. They need to not be the last streaming service to add an advertising tier when everyone else has one. And similarly, they should be doing, even if it's sports adjacent documentaries like the big Michael Jordan, they can be doing content around live sports, even if they aren't directly bidding for live sports rights. And they're doing some stuff with F1. I don't know if you think of car racing as like sports, maybe you don't, but they should be doing things in the ancillary market and news also, like you can get news free on your platform and that's in as long as you rev share so when you get advertising here you should be able to sign up a bunch of the news services just like roku has today which well, is an avot service lord do you want to just react to what an extraordinary <laughs> what an extraordinary 24 hours this has been for the company and i mean it is i think poetic justice that now you have finally upgraded them to market perform yeah, we've been a sell on this one for a really long time, and it was really painful going through COVID because they had a couple, you know, months where they were really strong. Look, I would say this. Um, we were right for the right reasons, meaning they needed an ad-driven tier so they could compete with everyone else at a lower price point. They do need to figure out a way to bundle their service because their churn is going up. They need to figure out a way to bundle the way Disney and Peacock and Paramount all have bundles. Um, and they really need to have a broader genre of sports because the consumer has the, the, the job that the consumer wants done is entertaining them in leisure hours. So when Russia invades Ukraine, you can't just have entertainment programming. You've got to have news programming on that day. 
And similarly with live sports, where there's something fantastic going on in the sports world, you need to be able to have access to that, and their competitors do. So they need to solve some of these genre issues, as well as the business model issues, as well as the bundling issues to lower churn. So we think they're on that path. I found yesterday very blamey of external factors and them reacting. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, they need to put more of that blame on their decision making being slow. So I'm hoping that this sort of, um, you know, slap in the face of these numbers they're reporting is a wake up call for them to start looking side to side because many streamers are doing much more innovative things. They need to be copying those other more innovative streamers. Mark Douglas, the ad man, let me turn to you because one of the things Laura pointed out was that even with this openness to advertising, the actual platform sounds like it could be at least a year away. How much more quickly should they be moving? And can you just respond generally to how this will change the landscape and the opportunities in streaming? Yeah, so I think it will take a bit of time for them to introduce um, advertising into the platform. I mean, there are a lot of decisions to make. Is it ads at the beginning of the shows, during the shows? Um, is what content is again? So there are a lot of decisions to make. That's going to take a lot of time. But, you know, fundamentally, there are consumers want to want to be entertained. And if Netflix brings in a price point that's on the level of a cup of coffee in New York City, you know, there's just a huge number around the new consumers, I think, are going to um, go on to Netflix. And I think that's not just in the U.S., where they have 70 and 80 percent market penetration. I think the opportunity worldwide for Netflix to continue to expand their user base is incredible. And I'm like, I, I would be buying Netflix all day long today at this price. <laughs> well, no one's stopping you, are they? <laughs> well, I am. So I hope everyone yeah, follow me so the price moves up. I'm all for it. <laughs> I, I love it. All right, Mark Douglas, make it a move on Net, uh, Netflix. Molly, let me turn to you, Molly Wood. There are a couple of things here, like Laura said, the company's own strategy is maybe no longer bearing out the way it once did when they were the early pioneer with their huge success in streaming. Let's talk about binging, for instance, whereas my colleagues point out, when you watch some shows on Apple and some of the other streaming platforms, they make you watch once a week like the old school TV uh, channels used to. What does it do? It makes you stick around for a little while longer. You can't just watch a show in a night and cancel it the next day. So, Molly, what do you think about the streaming competition today? And why are all the stocks down? Is the whole field just oversaturated? Isn't anybody benefiting from their declines? You know, it's interesting because Netflix certainly was the pioneer of, Netflix is in an innovator's dilemma, and they were the pioneer of what we came to call streaming fatigue, which everybody has. There are so many options right now. And Netflix tried to build a moat in effectively the worst and most expensive way possible, which was to pour money into content, which I can tell you is not a good strategy. It's expensive, and there's so much of it that it's very hard to compete. So they created this sort of populist product, but at premium pricing. I, I am not happy as a customer to find out that I was paying $20 a month to subsidize 100 million people who were password sharing when Netflix, you know, even before going so far as introducing something like ads, Netflix could be slicing and dicing the content it has and offering tiered subscriptions. Let people who are password sharing pay five or six bu bucks a month for just the library for example, or if you just want to get movies, create a tier for that. Like, I think there's a lot of creativity to Laura's point and innovation that could have happened all this time and networks, Netflix prioritized growing and then pumping out lots and lots of forgettable content that to your exact point, you could, Kelly, you could consume really quickly and then be done with, meaning you're on a permanent flywheel and pumping money into content like that is just a black hole. And Laura, I guess to kind of put a point on this, you know, we are seeing big declines across Paramount, uh, across the, you know, Disney, the rest of the landscape, even though we're saying there are aspects of those models that Netflix needs to emulate. What does that tell you about the value destruction investors are worried about here? So, yeah, I think the question that Netflix has raised is, is the total number of streaming subscribers smaller than we thought? And are the unit economics lower than we thought? So these enormous content budgets, Disney's going to spend 30 billion this year, of which 20 is on entertainment. Are they really ever going to pay off? Hmm. Um, but, but by the way, if the answer is no, that means just we get consolidation faster. There'll be three of these in three years instead of three of these in 10 years. So at the end of the day, a winning strategy is to lose streaming and get bought by one of the big guys. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Mark, actually, to that point, I was thinking about this, that Netflix is now, it's, this has really thrown open uh, the whole industry. I mean, when, when, the, when the incumbent looks mortal, then all of a sudden really interesting things can happen, right? I mean, I don't know what kind of combinations, advertising opportunities. The consumer is crying out for someone to rebundle all of this, aren't they? Yeah, a bit, but the look, if the average consumer, I think there have been studies done that say they're willing to spend roughly 40 to $50 a month on entertainment, basically streaming entertainment. So Netflix, I've always said, Netflix fills the hours between everyone else's hit shows <laughs> and, and even their own hit shows. When you are like, what are we going to watch? The first choice is, let's go and see what's on Netflix. That's not going away, which means Netflix is not going away. And then you have basically these other players trying to fill premium spots. So I think Netflix has always filled that position. They, they have a huge content library, and I think consumers, that's how they think of them, and that's not, that's not going to change. One other thing is those 100 million subscribers that are using other people's passwords, that's the first group, I think, as was mentioned, to start charging this lower tier price point to. So you're looking at just a huge, they could increase their customer base by almost a third just yeah. off those yeah. subscribers. Yeah. And that's why I think it's just an incredible opportunity that we're looking at, not like a downturn for Netflix. It's an, it's, it's an upturn, I think. We are one of those password sharing households. I, you know, my, my husband's sister's account. Yeah, Laura is too. Laura, can you quickly comment on uh, executive turnover? I mean, do if we're about to enter a different era in which consolidation is key, does that require a different management team? So, wow, that is a question I have not gotten yet today. But anyway, let's address first the employee turnover. As you know, there's a shortage of labor um, in America right now. And specifically relating to Netflix, we now have a price point at Netflix that they last achieved in 2018, which means if you've joined this company in the last five years, you are not making any money on your equity. I expect people to leave and go to Disney and go to Warner Brothers Paramount and go to Paramount. So that's going to be a problem for them because the most important asset you have is your content creatives, creatives and executives. So I expect them to start losing people, which will be a lead indicator to faster value destruction as they try to attract people with these lou this lousy stock price of theirs. Molly, if you would comment on that, kind of same question, you know, does this are we in a different and new era now for streaming? And if so, you know, what should the leadership look like and what should consumers expect? We unquestionably are. And again, although Netflix may have pioneered this shift to streaming and the shift to digital, if I'm going to pay 40 or 50 bucks a month for streaming, it's going to be increasingly hard to justify Netflix being half of that if they don't innovate. And so without immediate signs of innovation, whether it's you know creating new pricing tiers or figuring out how, for example, to do that shared watching experience where maybe one side of one party is renting a movie to watch, right? There are sort of so many opportunities for innovation. And I think if we don't start to see that in the next three months to six months, and all we see is like, well, we might pivot to ads eventually, then yeah, I think you do have to ask yourself real questions about leadership because there's no doubt at all that the landscape has changed. Everyone came for Netflix and Netflix did not change to keep up with them and that's a problem. And if there's one commonality from everybody's comments, innovation absolutely seems to be the key word here. We'll leave it there. Thanks, uh, this was so much fun. Laura Martin, Mark Douglas, and Molly Wood talking through the Netflix saga. Coming up, a bold...